Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for Friday Hacks. Uh, I know it's the end of the semester and most of us are busy. So, uh, yeah. So today we're going to have two talks. The first one is resurgence of artificial intelligence in travel and tourism, and the second one is stream processing with Kafka. Uh, so uh, let's begin with the first talk, and it's it's by it's by Desmond, uh, and Desmond graduated from NUS. With a master's of master's in knowledge engineering, he has more than eight years of experience in the in the industry and has has played around with a lot of things, including data science, AI, and AR. Uh, he's he's the co-founder of Zaltius Private Limited in Singapore, uh, which, as I was talking to him, does a bunch of stuff: a lot of internal products, data science education, data science consulting, and he's spearheading new products surrounding travel and healthcare using AI and AR technologies. So he'll be talking about resurgence of AI in travel and tourism. So yeah, uh, Desmond, over to you. I'll stop sharing my screen. Uh, yeah. Uh, do yeah. you mind if people yeah. interrupt you while to ask questions? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, cool. So feel free to interrupt and ask questions. If you're too shy, <clears throat> also type it in the chat. Uh, okay, yeah. Desmond, over to you. All right. So uh, thanks, thanks for that, uh, Chaitanya. So let me just share my screen. So good evening, everyone. So um, the, the topic which I'll be talking about is uh, on the idea of, you know, what AI really was when we were talking about travel and tourism. And um, we want to kind of understand, you know, how kind of it's broken right now. Uh, right. I mean, it's kind of broken right now. So we want to be able to see, you know, how can we potentially get it back to feet. Right. So and how, how is AI helping out in this area per se? OK, so let's take a look at some of uh, which I have. Okay, so uh, at least for the agenda right now, so I'll talk about the current status of uh, travel and tourism, right? So we want to unpack some of the algorithms that uh, was that 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 came before, and probably do think that some of them will still apply going forward. Okay, but we want to talk about uh, some of the things which are a little bit more exciting, whereby uh, whereby AI should be able to help out as well. So you know, I'm going to talk about a little bit more also on where AI is heading in that space. Okay, so um, where where does AI fit in, right? So this is as part of the uh, traditional ideas of uh, uh, where we did um, for traditional ideas of having uh, machine learning, right? And uh, also you know with the travel industry. So uh, so as part of the travel industry, we would have typically quite a fair bit of things, right? Uh, that that you can put in AI at. So there's quite, we, we talk about the first part whereby we have uh, the idea of awareness, whereby uh, people right, would start to get uh, inspired about it, right? So through social media, right? And want to be able to get a sense you know, of where they can go for their travels as well. So they want to say, you know, uh, they want to, I mean, as part of what used to be, right? Uh, as compared to where we are now, right? So we, where we are now, uh, just, you know, just recap for everyone who probably not know or have been living under a rock for the past one year right uh we are you know in COVID-19 situation whereby you know uh, life has taken quite a different turn right but you know this is kind of where uh we want to look back onto the past right I want to see you know where we potentially have gone before right so if what used to be was that people really want to get inspired you know right to uh, to see you know, where they want to get it for their go away for their travels it could be a two-day holiday in Bali right or so on Okay, so some of these things, right, uh, that would typically happen. So from there, you know, they may want to research and tra uh, on their traveling destinations and to visit, right, uh, take place where, where places they can visit, you know, what are the accommodations they could potentially have, you know, and what some of the activities that they may want to consider doing, right, over there. So from there onwards, right, they want to say, that, oh, how can I shortlist my activities? Uh, such that you know I can have it in a concise way, you know. So so if you take a look here, right, probably the first part, right, research planning, right, discuss, decide, and booking, right, of the actual destination itself, right, would actually take up quite a fair bit of time, right. So therein lies, right, uh, whereby we have things such as uh, um, tour tour packages, and you know uh, having places like TripAdvisor help us out in our planning for that. So AI uh, used to be able to help out here, right? And where would it help out then, right? They help out in the planning phase, right? Whereby, 
you know, you want to be sure that you can get your tickets, right? And you get the cheapest tickets on time, right? And you can get, you know, uh, some of those uh, uh, hotels, right? And you can have uh, last minute hotels, you know, and if you want to get those, uh, those places, you know, as cheap as possible, right? So uh, it really depends on what sort of traveler you are. So uh, some people, right, would then say that, you know, uh, because they are considered of the cheaper end of the spectrum, they would then, you know, not want to pay too much money for it. So uh, the key thing here is also the, in the preparation itself, right? Preparation for um, what they want to uh, bring, you know, and many things, right? So flight accommodation is definitely it. So tickets, right? And uh, we do have things such as, you no, know, once you are there, you know, what about renting a car? You know, what about you know, uh, being able to uh, travel between the different places? What are the uh, transportation needs that they do have, right? And so on. So many things, right? Uh, that one would typically think about. So this is uh, some of the main ideas, right? That one you know would typically uh, think about when they are traveling. At least this was what used to be, right? What used to be. It used to be a hassle to some people, right? And it used to be. A lot of work, right, to some people as well. So traveling isn't particularly fun, right? But I do think that quite a fair bit of people do miss those days. Okay, so right, um, then here as you no know, lies the question now, right? Did COVID nineteen disrupt the progress of AI, right, in travel and tourism, right? So uh, the answer here, I would probably say, right, is uh, a good, right, a good uh, maybe. Right, maybe it did. Right, maybe it did. Right, uh, for one, for sure. Right, uh, we want to learn about some of the algorithms that came before. Right, some of the algorithms that came before. So part of the reason we are taking a look at this is to understand why, right, is the system broken already? Right, because uh, it used to be whereby we are all scrambling for those cheap airline tickets. Okay, we used to be doing that. Right, and there used to be this thing called price optimization. Right, using AI. So there are some algorithms right, that are inside it. So we'll take a look at some uh, used to be state of the art for it because but right now the system is broken. Right? The system is broken. There is no need for price optimization right, because nobody's buying tickets. Right? So that has gone out the window altogether. Okay, so price optimization used to be king. Okay, and uh, the idea here is with price optimization, what are really people looking for? Right, we want to be able to say that, right, can we have some sort of a dynamic pricing technology that has AI, right, infused by AI here and that can help pinpoint certain buying patterns, right? So buying patterns that so accurately, you know, that you know, analysts can synchronize their pricing strategies kind of in real time, right? Which is kind of what happens, right? So there's this idea of uh, search pricing, right? And there's this idea of uh, uh, giving the right price at the right time for the right audience, right? So price optimization, right, used to be the hallmark, right, of, uh, of you know, of being optimizing for the airline industry itself. So people, uh, the airlines would definitely want to squeeze as much uh, revenue out of uh, those ticket sales. Okay, so, right, so what are the machine learning and AI algorithms behind this then, right? So let's take a look at uh, probably what you would consider state of the art, right? And uh, when we talk about quite a fair bit of machine learning competitions, uh, what would they use? So they would typically use this thing called extreme gradient boosting, right? So XGBoost as part of the uh, machine learning tool set. So XGBoost, uh, if you can tell by the picture itself, right, is uh, trying to grow this thing called trees, right? This thing called trees, right? So we want to start by understanding, right? What are these trees then? Okay, what are these trees then, you know, and uh, how, you know, this uh, idea of extreme gradient boosting, right, can help us out over here. So we start off by having a uh, decision tree. So here I lay on to you a scenario, right? So that, you know, we can build towards uh, XG boost, right? So uh, the first scenario which we do have uh, on hand is that if, uh, that if you are per se considered a hiring manager and you are interviewing several candidates at once, right? So if you are interviewing several candidates, right? And uh, with the decision tree, right? How would it play out? If the decision tree, then we take a look at the idea that if uh, every hiring manager, right, that that uh, that is available, right, would have a set of criteria, right, such as uh, the, the the candidate's uh, education level, right, number of years of experience, right, interview uh, performance, and so on, right. So, 
Right, so here we will say that uh, it is analogous to the hiring manager interviewing candidates, right, based on his or her own criteria. So each hiring manager has their own criteria, right? They just uh, look at the idea that, you know, uh, since we do have this criteria, right, I, no, so not, not we, I have my own criteria, I decide, right, whether I would want to hire the candidate or not. Okay, so this is a, a decision tree, right? So they have to take certain decisions based on the education level years of experience of the candidate, right? And many many other criteria, right? So now we try to build towards XG boost then, right? So uh, the next level, right, per se, of uh, decision tree, right? We're still looking at trees here, but now, right? Instead of uh, their hiring manager being a singular tree, right? We look at it from a interview panel per se, right? Uh, perspective whereby you know we have uh, each inter interviewer right each individual individual hiring manager right uh, has a vote right has a vote and they should be able to say right at the end of the day right they will combine all of them right if uh, four says they like the out of, out of a five right three says they like the candidate two say they don't like right so uh, obviously the three would win right so the the final decision will pull through over that so this process is what we call bagging right bagging so with uh, random forest itself, okay, uh, as a next, right, as a next uh, line of uh, algorithm here, okay, is uh, this idea that it is a subset, right, of the bagging methodology is now that uh, we have a lot of interviewers, okay, we have a lot of interviewers and each interviewer, right, will only get to ask the candidate, right, uh, probably only one question okay one question or two questions and from there onwards they get all of the uh, interviewers maybe instead of uh, five interview interviewers we get like uh, 20 right 20 interviewers to ask one or two questions only so once they do have that right then they will combine and do the same idea of bagging whereby they want to uh, get uh, the opinion from every single uh, person here so that you know they can get which one should should they hire right so before they make a decision should they hire the person or not Okay, so that is random for us. So now we have, again, we are trying to build towards X3 boost. So there are two more, right, before we talk about S3 boost. So uh, we talk about this thing called boosting, right, boosting. So here we will say that every uh, interviewer, right, will alter the evaluation criteria, right, based on the feedback from the previous interviewer. So we'll take one interviewer, right, we take the feedback, we'll pass it on to the other interviewer. So uh, with this in mind, then, you know, uh, with each yeah, with each interviewer, right, uh, interviewing the person, then we can say that this boosts, right, the efficiency of the interview process, right? We know such that, you know, there's added, right, this dynamic of uh, added uh, evaluation as well, right? Adding the, the evaluation of one candidate, right, being passed on to the next person, right, is there as well. So from then, then, you know, we have this idea of gradient boosting, right? So uh, gradient boosting is a, a special case now of, uh, of boosting itself where errors are actually minimized by this thing called gradient descent. Okay, so, uh, so we have this thing called uh, gradient descent, whereby we are just trying to figure out you know, where our local minima over here. And here, uh, as much as possible, the strategy, right, it will be for us to uh, find as much as possible, right, the, the case interviewers, right, the consulting firms leverage by, typically this is what consulting firms will actually do by using, right, uh, case interviews to weed out less qualified candidates. So we're going to do something like this over here in terms of gradient boosting. Okay, so finally then, right, we have XG boost, right, extreme gradient boosting over here. So extreme gradient boosting, right, uh, is really just gradient boosting on steroids, right? So here, you know, we, we really uh, do quite a fair bit of things inside. So we have uh, added randomness inside and added, uh, added ways for us to cut our tree. Right, such that you know we can uh, enable right uh, the idea that we can predict right the price of a of a airline ticket to be better as well. So we want to optimize the price of our uh, airline tickets over here. So we want to make use of these algorithms. Okay, so this is uh, from the get go, right? What used to be state of the art, right? Uh, at least even right now, right? A lot of machine learning algorithms would still make use of all these competitions will make use of XG boost, right? So let's take a look at an example over here. All right, so an example over here, right, we would have uh, this uh, data in Python itself. So what do we have, right? We have uh, the different airlines. So we have uh, Jet Airways, Indigo, 
Jet Airlines, uh, Jet Airways again, and different multiple carriers and Air Asia. So here, you know, we are looking at the idea that they have uh, the journey date, right? Where are they coming from? The source is it Delhi, Kolkata, right, Bangalore, right? Uh, and where is the destination that the person is heading? Right, could be Cochin, Bangalore, and so on. So here we do have a specific route as well, right? Departure time, arrival time, duration, total stops, and so on. Okay, so we'll take all of this data, right? We will do uh, some sort of cleaning, right? That's required. Okay, so we'll do the cleaning, right? And you'll do this thing called train test split, right? You split it up and then you'll pass it to our XGBoost algorithm, right? So when we pass it to our XGBoost algorithm, then what we are trying to do here is to ensure that uh, it can go ahead and process this. So here very quickly, I'm just going to point out a few things over here. So uh, we do have this idea of a learning rate, right? Which is to how much, right? Our tree will learn, right? We have a number of estimators. Number of estimators over here is the number of trees that we would have. So here by default, right? We kind of want to put in like say 300, uh, 200 trees. And how, how, what is the max depth of a singular tree, right? So um, this, you can think of them as the number of questions that they could have, okay? Number of questions that they would have. Right, so uh, for example, each right, each interviewer could have ten questions, right? So this would be the maximum depth right, of their question. Okay, so I won't dive too deep into the rest of the details, right? But the idea here is once we uh, build up right this uh, model itself, right? So we kind of understood right what was this uh, algorithm, which is uh, extreme gradient boosting, right? So. We, we kind of understood that, right? So we pass it into, then we, uh, we, we create it, right? And then we train our model on it, right? And X train and Y train data. So once we do train it, right? We would want them to go ahead and do some sort of prediction and finally some sort of uh, uh, error, right? We want to get our error. So here we use this thing called RMSC, whereby we are trying to evaluate the model as well. So the model here is evaluated to be uh, 1,281. So here uh, is this, idea of how far away right, uh, are we from the predicted uh, data itself, right? How far we are predict from the predicted uh, airline price. Okay, so this is as part of the traditional idea of optimization uh, for airline tickets, right? So we take all of this data and we want to optimize the price, right? Optimize the price and we want to figure out you know, how far away are we in terms of price prediction. So uh, for sure, right, uh, a lot of airlines would have uh, this sort of uh, 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 price optimization algorithm in terms of uh, machine learning, right, into it, which exists into their system, right. But uh, right now, right, they probably have turned all of them off, right, because uh, uh, now nobody is exactly flying, right, and uh, there isn't a need for you, for them to price optimize like so. Obviously, there are many more parameters that could be involved in this process, okay, but uh, we will not dive too deep into those. Okay, so. Uh, probably, right, uh, one of the main ones that actually came about was this thing called chatbots using AI as well. So this is for when we think we are speaking to a person, but actually not. So uh, quite a fair bit of uh, how we would uh, go ahead and try to buy even airline tickets or hotel, right, hotel uh, room stays, right, would be it used to be that we say that, okay, uh, chatbots were the future, right? So chatbots um, are definitely here to stay, right? But uh, right now the technology, right? Of the AI behind it wasn't exactly, uh, isn't exactly too strong, okay? But definitely is growing in terms of natural language processing, right? Uh, it's definitely growing. Okay, but obviously nowadays there's no one for you to talk to again and there's no one for you to buy your airline tickets from. Okay, so why do we need chatbots then, right? So you know, according to a Hub, HubSpot research, right, 71% of people use chatbots, right, to solve their problems fast, okay? So as of now, right, the biggest place where we see AI is in the hospitality sphere is chatbots for customer service, right? So when you are trying to purchase a ticket, right, right trying to purchase a uh, hotel room, right, all of those require some sort of customer service, okay? But, most probably quite a fair bit of us would have encountered right chatbots that fall flat on their face because they are not 100% to be able to uh, give us the right answers at the same time. Okay, but I do believe uh, SIA do, do they have, have their own chatbots as well, right? Called Chris, right? Which was uh, uh, launched in 2017. Okay, so, right? So chatbots typically allow significant advantage, right? 
at least back then, whereby they do provide full-fledged customer support, right? And we do reduce the load on personnel, right? Needed, right, to answer queries, right? especially if they are simple queries. Okay, so let's take a look at, you know, what are some of the AI and machine learning algorithms behind this as well. So some of the state of the art, right, that we may have uh, at that point in time, right, will be uh, this idea that chatbot itself, right, uh, would have a few things in mind, right? Number one, we want to uh, have some sort of a process in place, okay, some sort of process in place, and some of this process in place will be as part of machine learning, deep learning, natural language processing, all right, and uh, we get some sort of outcome right, in terms of predictive analytics, okay? So, right, we'll dive a little bit deeper into here as well. Okay, so what are the, some of the algos then? So uh, some of the deep algos that they would probably would have, right, is this thing called recurrent neural networks. So recurrent neural networks are pretty interesting, right, because uh, we want, since they are talking about trying to understand this thing called sequential information, right, of uh, trying to understand speech itself. So language, right, uh, would, would require some sort of processing because, uh, if you were to say a single sentence from the start, right? Uh, say, you know, uh, I am a boy, right? You know, are you free tomorrow, right? By the time you would process the word tomorrow, right? Would they uh, know that uh, that they are trying to talk about the person you, right? Are you free tomorrow, right? So you and tomorrow would they have such a link, right? So this this idea of recurrent networks then enable us to remember, right, uh, sequential information and information that has come per se from the past, right? So are you free tomorrow, right? You would probably appear before tomorrow, right? So would it be able to remember that, right? So the encoder's job is really for us to uh, encapsulate the information of the input text, right, into a fixed representation. Okay, so here we want to typically encode it into some sort of a vector, right? We'll typically vectorize it. And we would have recurrent networks inside as well. So again, the recurrent networks have a mechanism whereby we would enable us to re remember, right, uh, what has come before. Okay, so then uh, we will talk about this idea that we have a decoder, right? The decoder is then to take this representation and generate a variable length text that best responds to it, right? Best responds to it. So if we have some way of uh, text coming in, right? We want to be able to reply, right? In a manner which is uh, uh, legitimate, right? Legitimate. So, right. Not to say that uh, this is not, right? This is not uh, uh, useful right now because a lot of uh, ML tools, especially Right now, uh, if you have things such as uh, uh, Google Home, right, and you have uh, things such as uh, your your different chat bots out there, right, uh, as part of the Amazon ecosystem, Amazon Echo, right, you, you would have uh, all Alexa, right? So Alexa, you would have all of these algorithms built in as well. But I would dare say, right, as part of the travel industry, right, their uh, networks would be nascent, right, and uh, it would be not too great, okay, not too great. So let's take a look at an example over here, right, of uh, this. So say, for example, we take the input text, right, uh, we saw in the first image, right, given the phrase, are you free tomorrow? Like I kind of mentioned this just now already. Right, let's think about, you know, uh, how most people will answer that question, right? So you may want to say, yeah, I'm probably free, right? I'm, oh, I'm not free. Okay, so, you know, once you're done training the network, right, the probability Right, so the vector would you end up having some sort of probability of uh, your vector. So we you take your V and we have a probability of the answer, right? Probability of your answer. So Y1 over here, right? Y1 over here is the answer, right? The V is the vector which you are passing in, right? We kind of get up, end up with this probability of answer over here. So the, we'll get to see, right, which answer should be returned by the network itself, okay, by the machine learning network itself, the neural network. Okay, so the probability which is highest over here is yes, right, which is a uh, uh, no, sorry, is no with uh, 0 0.4 over here. So since this is the highest then, right, it will be returned, right, it will be returned. So we'll pass in, right, we'll pass in our string of text, right, and our network, right, will return us this as an output itself. Okay, right, so this was some of the uh, uh, outputs then that we probably previously would have had, right, so some of the, op the op price optimization one, which currently right now, obviously things are not working well for that. Right, and chatbot itself, again, because nobody is talking to the chatbot to get their answer. 
Okay, so uh, those are some of the algorithms that uh, would probably have come before in the travel industry itself. So let's talk a little bit more about um, the resurgence of it, right? We want to kind of understand, you know, uh, what could be the way forward next, right, for the uh, travel industry and how AI, right, can play a crucial role, right? So now, obviously, with uh, restricted travel, uh, tourism, travel and tourism, right, how can AI play a crucial role? over here. So AI, right, um, can help out definitely in a few ways, right, especially with the situation right now. Okay, so the idea here is recommendations, right, staycations, local discoveries are still here to stay, right. Recommendations for local staycations and local discoveries are still here to stay. So some of this um, idea here is that, you know, if you can't travel, you can't fly, right, uh, or at least the risk for flying is really high, right, what else can you do, right, so uh, we talk about some of the efforts, right, of the Singapore Tourism Board, right, but I, I would dare say up front first, right, I'm not a mouthpiece for the Singapore Tourism Board, okay, but what they're doing, right, is something which is uh, really helpful to help uh, at least the travel industry right now. Okay, so, <clears throat> We do have uh, this thing called Singapore Lee Day, right? So um, here uh, is, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure I just saw this website just launched a few days back, right? So uh, here, the idea here is what they're trying to do is to create your own Singapore Lee Day itinerary, right? So uh, here, I would dare say, right, uh, this website is still pretty rudimentary, right? So let's take a look at it, right? So this is how Singapore Tourism Board wants to uh, eight hours, right, in our travels. Okay, so as part of their website itself, they kind of have some sort of setup over here, right? Some sort of setup over here. So what is some of their setup over here? Okay, uh, they will say that, okay, you know, uh, please tell me, you know, uh, what precinct, right, would you like to be in, right? So please, you can choose as much precinct as you want, okay? Uh, you can choose, you know, uh, say, for example, Changi, East Coast, Chinatown, and so on. Right, you can share how much time you have as well, right, as part of your Singapore holiday, right? So the idea here is you say you can select all, right, or you can choose just one day, two days, or three days, right, as part of your uh, travels, right, around Singapore itself. And here, their target is to, is to say that, you know, uh, can we get a sensing of what the user actually likes, right? Can we get a sensing of what the user actually likes? So once they do have this, right, once they do have this then, right, they actually give you uh, a list of curated recommendations, right? So for example, this is a uh, three-day Singapore holiday in uh, Changi East Coast, right? Or in Chinatown and so on, right? So I do encourage uh, y'all to take a look at it, right? So um, with this in mind then, you know, they would say that, oh, okay, uh, you can open it up, right? And you can take a look at it, right? So uh, on my part, right? So I've taken a look at it, right? We have seen what's happening inside. Right, what's happening inside uh, is pretty much just right a, a curated right a human curated list of things to do right and some uh, recommendations which they do have but right? it is still curated okay so then you know you may want to ask right can AI do better right can AI do better because for sure right uh, what they have done is all human curated okay so Right, can AI do better then? Right, so I probably would think that the way forward that they could probably help out is using this thing called deep recommendation system. Okay, so deep recommendation systems, right, uh, would definitely be able to help users, right, uh, enjoy their Singapore holiday, right, in the travel space. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about you know what it originally is first. Okay, so. Uh, as part of a recommendation system, right, the traditional aspect of looking at it is to say, you know, uh, say, for example, if I am a person, right, so for example, I'm a person that uh, probably this is a runner, right, or this is a cyclist as well, right, one cyclist and another person who's actually really cycling, right, if you do have uh, two cyclists over here, we'll consider them to be similar people, right, similar people, right, if we do say that they are similar then, right, we would dare say that, you know, if they have bought right pizza right they have bought pizza right uh, both of them have bought pizza and both of them have bought the other dish over here right, i'm not too sure what this other dish it could be salad right salad over here pizza and salad if both of them have bought salad right however right we do have a person a over here right? person a over here 
So, oops, person A over here, whom, all right, person A over here, whom uh, is, who, who has bought, right, a canned drink, right? And this person cycling on the bike has not bought a canned drink, right? Would we be able to potentially, right, recommend him this drink, right? Recommend him this drink as part, right, as part of uh, the idea that, you know, they both uh, like to have the same drink, right? As part of the idea, they both like to have, they are both similar, right? And they have uh, they have similar interactions, right? They like the same thing, uh, i.e. the idea of exercising over here, right? Cycling, right? And they'll probably get the same item, right? Probably get the same item. Okay, so, right. So then this is as part of the traditional collaborative filtering, right? Traditional collaborative filtering. Okay, we want to get this idea in, right? So here we want to, uh, Right, so we say there's a text over here. The key idea is to learn, right, uh, the deep the user item interaction, right, user and item interaction. But now, right, we want to add on this idea as well of neural network. So we kind of saw a neural network just now already in terms of recurrent nets, okay. But um, we may want to consider, right, using this thing called a neural uh, network based collaborative filtering, right. So here we do have many, right, many in this. Uh, uh, many in this space itself, right? And how can we uh, ensure that everyone is able to uh, help out in this space as well? Okay, so let's take a look at it, right? For a neural network-based collaborative filtering. Okay, so here, right? Uh, I'll just pretty much draw over here as well, right? So if you can see, right? If you can see over here, right? On this side, right, on this side, on the left side over here, we have this thing called a general matrix factorization, right? General matrix factorization, which is this idea of uh, decomposing our data, right? Decomposing our data into a uh, covariance matrix, uh, which is uh, typically going to be uh, spread out in nature, right? So covariance matrix, which is typically going to be spread out in nature. And here, right, with our, and we will do this thing called matrix factorization in order for us to obtain out a uh, common matrix over here, right? Which is this moment, right? Common matrix over here, right? X one, right? So here, typically, right, as part of collaborative filtering, right? When we have this, when we pass into uh, pass it and get our final output as as to y hat, it will probably be considered done already, right? This is typically as part of traditional collaborative filtering. Okay, but uh, if we would then consider, right, uh, having a hybrid architecture over here, right, with deep networks, right, we want to add up this idea over here as well, right, this second part, right, so this second part over here, oops, right, this second part over here, right, uh, is essentially, right, our, uh, essentially, our neural network, right, and this neural network over here, right, can be as deep as we want, right. So there are many cases that can be made made use of as well. So we do have this thing called auto encoders, right. We do have uh, uh, we do have a convolutional neural nets that we can add on as well. So we what we'll do is we'll pass them in, right. Uh, get the output from our uh, auto encoders, right, and finally also say you know. Um, Right, what is a uh, defined output? So we'll concatenate them, all right, and we'll have this uh, neural network uh, matrix factorization layer over here, all right? So we'll put that in, right, and we'll get a final output as a hybrid system itself. Okay, as a hybrid system itself. So these are some of the things that could potentially be done, right? Especially when we are uh, uh, trying to make use of a deep recommender itself. Okay, so. Um, I mean, that is the way forward, right? At least uh, we want to try to look at this idea of recommending these packages that we kind of saw earlier over here, right? But we want to recommend them using deep recommendation systems instead of a human creator, curated one. Right, so let's take a look at, um, you know, what could potentially be, right, other AI applications in the travel and tourism space then. Right, just let me get rid of the drawings over here, right? Uh, we have uh, other applications over here, right? And the other applications, uh, the idea that we have AI, right? With augmented reality, right? AI augmented reality, which is uh, kind of a new thing right now, 
right? And we would potentially have AI with blockchains as well. So what, what could that possibly be, right? So this is one of the ways forward as well. So AI and blockchain, right, could be used such that, you know, we can enable, right, uh, contact tracing of people, right, uh, contact tracing of people and be able to uh, enable uh, this, this idea that, you know, you want to be able safe, right, when you travel itself, okay? So we also do have uh, AI-powered contactless uh, chatbots as well, right? So AI-powered contactless chatbots, right, would enable, right, uh, would enable people to be able to say that, okay, right? Uh, not, not, sorry, I do apologize, not chatbots, robots, okay? Robots. So we can enable people to have, you know, new experiences whereby they don't have to interact with people, right? Don't have to interact with people when they are trying to um, experience their holiday in Singapore itself, okay? So these are some of the further applications that we could potentially have. Okay, so... Right then, so uh, Singapore right, definitely hopes that you know, artificial intelligence would boost its tourism industry. So this is as part of CNBC, right, who published this right, just recently on around September uh, 21st, uh, 23rd, right, September 23rd. So this is all relatively new. Okay, so as part of this idea that all of them are still relatively new, right, uh, all these are still definitely right, uh, kind of the way forward that we would possibly think. Okay, so uh, with that, then, you know, I would uh, end my session. Okay, so thank you. All right, you can reach me here. Uh, thank you, Desmond. Uh, are there any questions by anyone? Uh, any questions? Feel free to type it on the chat. Um, uh, seems like no, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I actually had one question, yeah, sure. Um, so, you talked about a lot of machine learning architectures which is used in uh travel, but one thing which is one another thing which is recently picking up a lot of popularity is GANs, mm, yeah. Uh, and I was wondering if there are any applications. So recommenders with GANs definitely are there as well. So GANs with deep recommenders with GANs are there as well. So uh, obviously generative adversarial nets right, are definitely part of the ecosystem as well. It's just that uh, the hybrid architecture of it right, will be pretty complicated to explain, right? Since you probably want to <laughs> explain the idea of recommenders as well. Then you want to explain on how can we uh, dive in such that recommenders can be linked up together with uh, uh, with the 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 GANs as well, okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, if there are no more questions, then yeah. I think we can end the talk. Uh, thank you, Desmond. Yeah. Thank you. So I do apologize. I do have to drop off. Yeah. yeah sure. Yeah. yeah. It's all good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let me share my screen for a while. Uh, Khan, are you there? Can you hear me? Hey, hi, yes. Hey, hello. Uh, okay, so I think we'll take a five minute break and then oh, sure. we'll be starting with the second talk if that's fine. Great. Yeah. yeah. So just, just give me a while. Uh, let me share my screen. Sure. Uh, meanwhile, do you want to test your screen and see if, if you want to screen share everything's working fine? Oh, sorry, I'm mute. So I could try to share the screens. Uh, yeah, you can, you can try. Okay. 
So can you see the slide? Yeah, it works. Full, full screen also can see? Yeah, can see. Great. Okay. Uh, if you don't mind stopping your screen sharing. Uh, sure. Uh, so. Okay, uh, so Khan, do you mind if people interrupt you to ask questions? Okay, I think you're on mute. Yes, yeah, please, yeah, okay. just okay. interrupt me at any time you have questions. Okay, so uh, feel free to interrupt Khan and ask questions. Uh, if you're too shy, feel free to ask it on the chat. So yeah, uh, Khan, over to you. Okay, thanks. Uh, I will start to share the screens. Can you see the slide? Can see. Okay, great, thanks. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I think uh, maybe I, I will introduce again in case someone just joined the talk. So my name is Khan, I'm a team lead of a chat platform team in uh, Zendesk. Uh, today I will give a talk about the stream assessing with Kafka stream. How we handle 2 billion triggers a day. Um, basically, uh, this is one of the new service recently we was uh, working on. Uh, so trigger service is, um, so it's a, a function in the current monolithic uh, application and uh, we are advanced files. It's one of the heavy uh, function. It's take a lot of CPUs of the um, current uh, main monolithic uh, application. So that's why we want to build a new uh, microservice to handle this kind of, this kind of function. And uh, we are decide to use the Kafka stream uh, to uh, fulfill this one. So, uh, so this is the agenda of my talk. So uh, I, I go, uh, first one, I will discuss about the trigger service, you know, what, what is the function of this service, what uh, is uh, about the, some about the business rules. And uh, then I will share about the, the, our development progress. Uh, next one is to be some challenge we're facing. So uh, I'm happy to share with you like uh, some challenge we face and how we uh, tackle them. And last one is a uh, question and answer, but feel free to interrupt me if you have uh, any questions. Okay, so for trigger service, uh, basically um, tr trigger is a, uh, so uh, trigger is kind of like, uh, it's a business rules where we can define some actions. Uh, if the action will be fine if some condition happens. So for example, as you can see the trigger here, um, the trigger the, uh, the trigger here say that when a visitor has loaded the chat widget, uh, we will check on the follow condition. For example, the visitor page title contain pricing. Then you will send a message to visitor like uh, thank you for checking with our page something like that. So when a visitor go to some websites of our customer of Zendesk customer and they uh, using our widget, our check widget. Um, if the condition, if the visitor they uh, browse to the page where the uh, page title uh, has the pricing in in this title, uh, a new message will be auto pop up and it will send this message to the visitor. So we try we trying to uh, so this function is like trying to uh, have conversation with the visitor in case they have uh, any question. Yeah. So a, a trigger is uh, is uh, composed of condition and actions. So if the condition uh, satisfied, then the action will be fine. If not satisfied, then nothing will happen. Um, so uh, this is the trigger service. So it's a microservice to handle trigger. And uh, given a visitor event, when a visitor, they have any event on the page, we will actually, what we do is we will evaluate all of the triggers belong to this account and execute action for each trigger if they uh, they are satisfied. So uh, you can there are some account that even have a 1000 of trigger. It means uh, when a visitor, they just go in one page behind it. Actually, there might be 1000 uh, trigger they are evaluated. And uh, if they uh, satisfy the condition, then the action will be fired. So actually this talk I, pre I, pre I was preparing on <laughs> February time for life nine months ago. And at that time, uh, the, we, 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 we do, I do the um, calculate on the volumes. So we, at that time we proceed around 2 billion triggers a day. Uh, but actually, uh, like, I think just two days ago when I check again and now 
maybe the during the week there's a some day of peak and it's now it's reached like three point three three point four billion triggers a day, and as you can see, so you can see the volume is uh, almost like uh, increased around 10, fifty to seventy percent. Yeah, the peak is almost doubled. Yeah. Okay, so uh, next I will talk about the, our development process. Um, so this is the architecture of the um, surface. So as you can know, uh, as I mentioned, we are using the Kafka stream. So uh, trigger service, they will talk with Kafka to uh, this is the input of the service. Uh, they will read all of the, uh, basically they will accept all of the uh, in visitor events. And uh, then they will talk with MySQL to get all of the trigger belong to that account. So when a visitor, they accept to some page, we will know that that page belong to which account, and then we try to uh, get the list of trigger on that account. Then we will uh, evaluate for each trigger, and uh, if the trigger satisfied, we will find some action. So there are two services. The trigger service will talk. Uh, one is uh, LC and one is Scribe. Basically, it's just uh, some service to execute the action. And we go uh, trigger service will not the one who do the um, action by itself, but they go con other service, in this case, to other service to uh, fulfill the actions. Uh, so far, is there any question on this? Okay, great. So uh, for technical stack of uh, this service, so we use a Java drop wizard framework and uh, Kafka stream processor APIs, uh, Google portable for schema. Uh, this, this one is uh, for the internal communication. So as you know that, um, a Kafka stream, uh, when normally if some app simple, they may be just like you read with the service, read the Kafka input, and they may send out some message to Kafka too. So it will be just uh, read input from Kafka and send output to Kafka. But uh, for some complicated service where we have a multiple component inside the service and they, the communication also via Kafka. So there will be some internal uh, topic used to uh, talk between each component inside the Kafka stream. Uh, later I will talk about, and the, the one we use the uh, Google Octobuff schema to, um, um, how would say, compress the message. Uh, for testing, we use Kafka stream test uh, YouTube framework, drop we are testing. Uh, for automation test, uh, we use the, our internal framework. Uh, basically is, um, what library I forgot? Uh, Selenium's Python, based on the Python so that we can, uh, I do one of the one of the UI uh, automation. Yeah. For Moon Train, we use a uh, data dump dashboard, uh, lock and uh, sentry. Uh, yeah, sorry, this is what uh, they list. I also have <laughs> problems. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, let's continue. Um, so I, I will talk. I will talk uh, more about the uh, Kafka stream. So basically, uh, for Kafka stream, there are two kind of. Um, Inside, there are two frameworks. One is called uh, processor, they are using processor API, and the other one is uh, called Kafka Stream APIs. So Kafka Stream API is uh, more high levels. Uh, they will define a lot of, uh, for example, common data transformations, for example, MAT, filter, and joy. Uh, this one is very useful if we want to do something called data ETLs, uh, where we just want to do extract data, uh, do some transformation, and then send out. Uh, but for our survey, because um, the business tree is very complicated, so we decided to use process API where we can define a lot of uh, logic um, to evaluate the triggers. Um, yeah, so we we using the process APIs. Okay. Uh, so this is the when we use the process API. This is the, what we call Kafka stream topology. So basically, uh, a Kafka stream is. They may have a different, they, we, we, it's called processor. It means it's like a something, it's a graph, and each node is going to be a processor. A processor will receive the input from Kafka, and uh, uh, after the process, they may send out the data to uh, forward the output to another processor. So as you can see, the, um, 
the whole topology is has uh, four com main component. Uh, the, the, the component on the top left uh, is the visitor state. So basically this one will subscribe for all of the topic related visitors so that we can know uh, what is the visitor state that for example, we may want to know about the visitor country, something like that, or uh, what else? Uh, we want to know about the um, visitor country, visitor uh, browser, which browser. Yeah. For account, uh, we also need the, the service also need to subscribe for some uh, input topic about account because uh, we there are some conditions where we want to check about account status. For example, the account whether the account is online or offline. It means for them when the visitor they go to some website. And the account is offline. It's mean at that one is like our uh, office hour. So they they may want to say something like, uh, "Sorry, uh, this is, we are in uh, our office hour. Uh, we uh, if you need anything, please email us uh, at this address." Something like that. Yeah. Uh, then we also have a processor uh, to manage the account trigger catch. So basically, we we don't want to uh, con too much database con uh, to get the. Um, List of trigger for each account because uh, the volume of the trigger is uh, is uh, very large. So so we will catch the visitor. Um, sorry, we will catch the triggers of an account. But uh, if anything change on the trigger of an account, so we will listen to that uh, Kafka topic. And if this one happen happen, we will invalidate the catch. Uh, the last one is a department state. So um, in term of the support, uh, they an an account they may have different departments. For example, it might be sale, it might be promotion, it might be a payment. So um, the department state, this one is will be to handle about the, what is the department state that for them, whether they are mainly it will be whether they are online or offline. Yeah. Um, so the, as I, I share for testing, we use uh, unit. Uh, we do a lot of tests, including unit tests, integration tests, automation tests. Uh, for monitoring, I, I cannot share very detail on uh, the graph. But basically, this is the whole. Uh, I think this one might be updated. We may increase add a few more, but uh, this is quite yeah, um, yeah a bunch of uh, monitor. We 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 are checking the for monitoring the service. Uh, but I can share like what kind of uh, metric we uh, considering for the um, monitoring of Kafka stream app. So basically the more, uh, some more important is the latency, throughput and succession rate. Uh, succession rate here in this mean is that um, we want to know whether uh, given a trigger, uh, when we evaluate, sometimes for some reason we just fail to um, evaluate. Uh, so we will log on that one and we, we have a metric to monitor whether the, 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 our, the service is working properly or not. Uh, save an action. So because of this trigger service also depend on all the service. So when we call all the service to execute the action, uh, this one will monitor the succession rate of the, the con. And also various of uh, uh, Kafka metric quite standard, including uh, producer, consumer uh, topic. For producer, we will check about the volume of data we send out. Consumer is will be uh, also the um, volume we uh, read from the Kafka. Uh, the, the, and also some important is like a consumer lag. So if the app uh, doesn't cannot catch up with the current volume, the, there will be a lot of message they need to process. So in that case, the consumer lag is will be very high. And uh, you, you, this one is very critical because for trigger service, we want the action execute within maybe like one second or half a second because visitor can go through another page really very fast. For example, if the visitor go a web, web a page and we want to send some message to visitor, but the if the sending message is delayed within one or two seconds, then the visitor already can already gone. They may turn off the page or they may switch to another page already. Yeah, so the the the, the latency and the lag is uh, very critical for this service. We also monitor about the catch performance where uh, what is the hit rate, uh, miss rate. Uh, yeah, and also uh, he created the database connection pool metric. So uh, by using he created library uh, to, to talk with uh, the database and uh, yeah, some uh, standard CPU uh, metric, including CPU, memory, list, and network. Sorry, the system uh, metric. Yeah, next is um, I want to share some challenge we were facing during the development of the 
the, the service. Um, the first one is uh, this year Java, uh, this year Java app. And uh, the first thing we face is app memory. <laughs> yeah, so a lot along the way we start to roll out, uh, not, not roll out, I mean, not roll out to the visitor, but when we start to uh, start to set the production um, data. So after we uh, finished the uh, implementation, uh, we, we on staging, we feel, oh, okay, it's ready. Then we start to work on uh, production and uh, yeah, it's out memories. <laughs> so what, what we learned, <laughs> uh, so at that time, uh, so we just do, uh, when an app memory happened, what we do is we go lock to the box and uh, we have, uh, we run the Java uh, commands so that we can know what, what is uh, in the hit. Uh, memory. So at that time, we uh, found out that actually we create a lot of uh, future object. So yeah, based on that information, we know uh, we can local allocate uh, where where the bug come from, and uh, yeah, we fix it. Yeah. The second one is a uh, Kafka chain log. So uh, trigger circuit we use the um, uh, what that one from. Uh, trigger data, uh, sorry, Kafka data store to uh, store the information. So basically, it's similar to Redis. It's a key value data store, uh, and and behind it, Kafka also use uh, uh, some Kafka, uh, Kafka topic to store uh, the to store the state of the uh, one of the key values. So when when an uh, when a rebalance happening or when we deploy the app, uh, restart the app. Is a, rebal a rebalancing will happen. In that, at that time, the consumer uh, need to rebuild the whole state store. It means they will, for example, there's a key uh, and the value is uh, updated like um, that. First, it's updated to value 10 and then later update to uh, 20. So in the history, there will be two commands of update, update to 10, update to 20. But eventually, the final values, the snapshot at uh, the latest one is will be 20. So uh, what what the review says, so it means they could read on of the update. In this case, it would be update 10 and then update 20, two times yeah, uh, to build the state store. Uh, but as you can see that the, our state store is around 300 gigabyte uh, at, the, at the peak. So it means the whole data is will be a lot of updating and to be, review the state store take a lot of time. Uh, this one is not good for when we deploy the, the, the service. Um, so the Kafka have some uh, concept con, uh, about the uh, retention segment and compression. Basically, it means uh, if we have multiple updates in a certain of duration, we just compress them and just ignore the old one, just keep the last one. So this is the, what, what uh, Kafka do behind it. So we play a lot with the configuration of a segment, delete retention, and compression to reduce the um, to reduce the chain lock. Uh, and as you can see, uh, after we try a lot of way and we managed to achieve uh, to reduce the reduce the um, chain lock from 300 gigabytes to 100 gigabytes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, last one I want to share is uh, some lesson we uh, learned uh, through this. Uh, uh, development of this service is that uh, so make sure the app have a uh, login and monitoring CI CD on the first day uh, it's very important um, and uh, writing tests and monitor at merchant you can uh, we use actually we use traffic uh, traffic when the time I prepared this talk but uh, now we are moving to github actions uh, yeah we still use the data doc uh, actually, now we also use login uh, with Datadog tools. So Datadog is going to be for both log uh, for the log um, message and also for um, monitoring. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's uh, all of my uh, uh, talk. So uh, last is uh, question and answers. I'm I'm happy to uh, answer your questions. Okay. Thanks, Khan. Uh, are there any questions? Are there any questions? If, okay, looks I don't think anyone has any questions. I actually do. Uh, so it's, so my one question I had, so this entire talk was focused on Kafka, mm. but I was wondering if there are other services which can help you achieve the same goal. And why is it that you guys went forward with Kafka instead of something else? Oh, I see. 
uh, maybe I, I, I think I will, at first, uh, now is uh, in, in uh, chat or in our, in Zendesk, everything we talk is via Kafka. So Kafka at the input and output is the first. I think uh, the, maybe uh, some people, my question is like, so either I answer your questions, it, it, that does, but okay. So, but why was why were all of the services based on Kafka? Oh, okay, stuff <laughs> okay. I, I can talk more about this. So basically, the good thing of Kafka is that they they support for the asynchronous, right? So it means uh, you can support you can view a different service, and they like if you want to con something or you want to notify someone, you don't need to con it. But we have a layer in between. It's a Kafka, and uh, okay. so the the consumer. The uh, producer, they just send, and consumer, they just uh, uh, subscribe to that topic. But I think a, a lot of people okay. will ask is that um, why would you Kafka stream? But don't don't you all the types. Like for example, you may know uh, uh, a lot of uh, Kafka library to just handle Kafka. Yeah. So uh, actually, there's a lot of library handle Kafka uh, for them. Fling also. Actually, Fling is the one who much more advanced and uh, good in, uh, I mean, more famous. <laughs> yeah, but I think Kafka, uh, maybe two years ago, Kafka stream is still behind Flink. Uh, but I think now Kafka stream is uh, catching up and the library is very good to um, uh, do this kind of um, uh, data processing. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, Thanks so much, Khan, for your talk and your time. I, I thought it was very interesting. Uh, I didn't know what Kafka was, so I got to learn quite a bit. I see. Uh, uh, yeah, so if you don't mind stopping your screen share, uh, I just want to display one last oh. slide and then we can end the talk. Sure. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, I forgot. I, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so Zena is hiring if you or your friend are uh, looking for a job or interesting, yeah. Uh, yeah, please check our career website. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks so much, Khan. Uh, if you, uh, someone asked. Oh. Yeah. Someone asked if you're looking for interns. Oh, so uh, right now we we are not looking for intern, but next year, yes, we have uh, intern positions. I don't know whether it's open or not yet. Uh, this one I haven't checked, uh, but. Uh, yeah, we go have next year, 2021. Yeah, currently, so yes, uh, currently is no this, one not not yeah not open yet. Okay, uh, okay, thanks so much, Khan. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks for your time on a Friday. Yeah, <laughs> actually, my previous talk is supposed to be on Valentine's Day. Wow, and just still they are working, study so hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you don't mind stopping your screen share. Sure, thank you. Okay, uh, just let me display something. Okay, uh, thanks everyone for joining us for our last Friday hacks. Uh, It'll be great if we can get some feedback because we're still trying to improve our events. So you can scan the QR code or use the link to fill, to, to put some feedback on. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks, Khan. Uh, I think that's the end of today's talk. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.